Okay, hi everybody, thanks for coming today. And again, I've had just a little bit of um, a busy time over the last little bit getting my mother, my elderly mother uh, sort of set up on her land to live with us. And we've just been building like crazy. I'm still building today. Uh, well, yesterday, and I've got uh, plans again to do it. So it's just been a really, really busy time. So I'm sorry I haven't been recording or doing classes as much as I, I usually do, unfortunately. But I do want to sort of get ahead. I've got the next little bit, which is good. I have to go back to work in, a, in about a week's time or so. And I'll be away for a lot. So I'll be able to record a few classes then. And we can just finish this module of uh, Song Half is Essence of Eloquence. And... Um, Essence of True Outputs, I should say. And this is, of course, the book that I'm always plugging. Um, I turn this is um, Robert Thurman's. This is kind of like the original one that uh, he did. I guess this might have been, uh, let me just see when this came out. I remember buying it a million years. 1984, wow. So this is, I really recommend, even if it's the, um, you choose not to read the actual text itself. I've known so many people when I was in grad school that never read books, but they'd only read commentaries to books, and that's fine if that's what you want to do. But the first, um, like I mentioned, maybe 170 pages or so, like pretty well half the book is Ro Professor Thurman, Robert Thurman's commentary on it. It's very easy to read, and it's very good. It's excellent. And um, it gives you a whole overview of what the book's about. And again, just sort of the background of, of it. And just Buddhist philosophy and Buddhism in general. So it's very, very good. I, I'd really, really recommend that. And then, of course, we are uh, working on um, do, using the notes um, from ACI class number uh, 15 from uh, uh, Geshe Michael Roach, which is so good, what the uh, Buddha really taught or what he really meant. And uh, again, I always sort of... Um, point to one of my friends and teachers, Lama Ben, and his uh, course that he did just this past year on this very same material, which was so good. And so if you can go to his Patreon account, I always have the link down at the bottom, you can follow his classes too and just sort of um, see. So anyway, let's get uh, to business here. And um, yeah, okay. So let's read the Heart Sutra to start, like we usually do. Okay, how much of the perfection was in the Blessed Mother? Thus I have heard at one time the Blessed One was dwelling in Rajguru and Mass Walter's Mount together the greatest assembly amongst nuns, greatest assembly of Bodhisattvas. That time the Blessed One was absorbed in the concentration of countless aspects of phenomena called profound illumination. That time also Supreme Bhagavad the Bodhisattva, the great beings looking perfectly at the practice of profound perfection of wisdom, looking perfectly also the five aggregates being empty and inherent existence. Then through the power of Buddha, Venerable Shari put to send to Supreme Bhagavad the Bodhisattva, the great being. How should a son of the lineage train who wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection wisdom? Thus he spoke, and Spiro Balakshvara, the Bodhisattva, the great being, replied to Venerable Chariputra as follows. Chariputra, whatever son or daughter of the lineage wishes to engage in the practice of profound perfection wisdom, should look perfectly like this. Subsequently, looking perfectly and correctly, also the five aggregates being empty in her existence. Form is empty, emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is not other than emptiness. Likewise, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. <coughs> Should I put you like this all phenomena or emptiness having no characteristics? They, have no, they are not produced and do not cease. They have no defilement, no separation from defilement. They have no decrease and no increase. Therefore, should I put you in emptiness? There is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, and no consciousness. There is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mentality, no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no tactile object, no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so forth, up to no mentality element, also up to no element of mental consciousness. There is no ignorance and no exhaustion of ignorance and so forth after no aging and death, no exhaustion of aging and death. Likewise, there's no suffering, origin, cessation, or path, no exalted awareness, no attainment, also no non-attainment. Therefore, Shari to put you, because there's no attainment, body sappers rely on in a mind of perfection of wisdom. Their minds have no obstructions and no fear. Passing out of beyond perversity, they attain the final nirvana. Also, all Buddhas reside perfectly in three times, having relied upon the perfection of wisdom, making manifest complete, but this is a state of unsurpassed, complete enlightenment. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, and surpassed mantra, the equal to the unequaled mantra, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering, since it's not false, should be known as the truth. Mantra of perfection of wisdom is proclaimed, Tayatum, Gata Gata Pira Gata Parasam, Gata Bodhi Soham. Shari put your Bodhisattva, great being, should train the profound perfection of wisdom like this. Then the Blessed One arose in that concentration, said to Spirit Bhagavad for the Bodhisattva, the great being that had spoken well. Good, good, son, it's just like that. Since it's like that, just as you have revealed, in that way the profound perfection of wisdom should be practiced, so the Catholic Gattis will also rejoice. When the Blessed One had said this, the Venerable Shariputra, Supriya Valakshvara, the Bodhisattva, the Great Being, 
the entire circle of disciples, well as worldly beings, gods, humans, demigods, and spirits, were delighted and highly praised what had been spoken by the Blessed One. Okay, so just starting with our meditation now, let's just take a moment to uh, sort of make ourselves comfortable, and then we will do the hundreds of deities of land of joy again, like Gema, from Sankapa Guru Yoga, just to bless our minds for practice studying Essence of True Eloquence here. Again, we are seated in a wide open space, ground like lapis lazuli, but <clears throat> as far as the eye can see, sort of wide open plain. And now we can see ourselves surrounded by the whole sort of universe or cosmos of um, cyclic existence with all the different um, sort of life forms, different beings, or the different realms. So as for auspiciousness, our mother is on our left, our father is on our right, the people we um, our closest to or behind us, it's the kind of angle there, um, sort of as our support, so the people we love the most, and then in front of us, people we like the least or have issues with are sort of in front of us as objects of our prayers and compassion and mind transformation. So it's like our own little mandala of all the people closest to us in this life that we're kind of moving uh, through life with. And then as we go out, it's all sort of becomes more sort of the strangers or beings that we don't know. So we can just feel that the whole human world is here with us, people from all different countries and places and cultures and so forth. And we can think about places uh, where there's so much war and conflict and suffering. And we can sort of put these all the people involved there in front of us. Objects of healing. You just think of the Ukraine and Gaza, and I mean the, the list is getting longer and longer and longer nowadays of all the terrible places where there's so much war and anger and hate and suffering and this and that. Uh, everybody in there, <clears throat> these situations needs their minds to be healed, their bodies to be healed, souls to be healed. So we can really sort of bring our prayers and energy to them. All the different animals and natural ecosystems here with us. We can just sort of say like, like Mother Earth or Gaia, or the plants and insects, animals, and so forth. We can feel that the whole spirit world, which is just as varied and numerous as the animal world, is here with us and all being spirit beings from the different uh, planes. So you can think of the astro, ether, and elemental planes. Celestial beings like gods and demigods are here, and countless beings in lower states of rebirth, uh, hell beings and hungry ghost beings are here. So we're all just here like a huge sentient being family, beautiful blue sky above us in the sky now, we're visualizing just kind of like world to world too, like the moon and the, the earth coming together. Uh, Tashita Pierland, Buddha universe, uh, Ganden Pierland. Beautiful, virtuous, pure world uh, of the universal Buddhists who teach Buddhism, Buddha Shakyamuni, Maitreya, and so forth. So we can think of all the thousand Buddhas of this aeon alone are here in this pure land. It's also the pure land of the Buddha wisdom and Jishri, who, of course, by teaching emptiness and ultimate truth, would be there in this pure land with the universal Buddhas. So this is a beautiful world. That we see just in the sky above us, of uh, you know lakes and forests and plains and flowers and so forth and mountains, and we're seeing sort of downtown, so to speak, the little town of Tashita Pierland, all the different temples and shrines and uh, stupas and so forth, filled with Buddhas, Bodhisattvas, gods, goddesses, monks and nuns and yogis and yoginis and all sort of Arya beings and these sort of all beings, sort of higher beings who are uh, like uh, Arhats or Buddhas and so forth, they're all here, you know, studying and meditating, doing Dharma activity. In the center, <clears throat> like a huge cathedral like Notre Dame, is open, we can see in, is the fifth universal Buddha, Buddha of loving kindness, Maitreya, who's set to enter this world soon. Beautiful golden body seated in, on a throne, um, like in a chair. So only two white lotuses, <clears throat> blossoming the ears with a Dharma chakra and a gold initiation vase. He's got the turning of the wheel of Dharma mudra in his heart. And just looking at him, he's just so beautiful. He's just like pure love. And he's going to come down to the world and spread love everywhere. Kind of like a new, I don't use the term as it's so loaded, but kind of like a new messiah, like a new sort of spiritual leader of the world for all sentient beings without exception, teaching loving kindness and bodhicitta and compassion. 
So his left or uh, his uh, right or left, I should say. So sort of the side here is the founder of the Old Kanapa School of Tibetan Buddhism, the wonderful Indian pandit <clears throat> Buddha Saint, Buddha superstar, so to speak, is a Tisha Tifankara Vijana, and he's in lotus position, three robes of a monk, yellow panna's hat, and with three uh, turning the wheel Dharma mudra in his heart showing the unity of all the profound and vast paths. So teaching on mind only and Magimika and so forth. He's just had the entire uh, Buddhist uh, scriptures sort of at his fingertips, an amazing Lama, bringing Buddhism to Tibet in the 11th century. And on the other side, Jay Sankapa, so on our right, or Maitreya's left, and uh, Jay Sankapa's in the way we usually see him again, with Three rows of monk, yellow pants, cat, uh, cap, his um, legs in lotus position, uh, uh, his hands are in the eternal uh, uh, wheel of dharma mudra, holding two white lotuses, where on the white lotus is the Prajna Parmiya text and flaming sword, and founding the new Kadapa school, sort of continuing to teach his lineage in the 1400s to in our tradition, continuing to this day. So that's it. <clears throat> the Lama's with Maitreya. Now Maitreya's heart, that little first little gold and eternal knot symbol, comes beautiful white cloud starts flowing, the cloud starts sort of getting bigger, sort of more coming towards us. And on them are again Jay Sunkap and his two heart students, Japa Gyatso and Kidruche. And those are two monks in front of him, lowest position, three robes of a monk and a yellow pen his hat. And they've got their teaching mudra, which is with the right hand and heart, holding the Dharma text in their lap. So this is like an elaborate visualization you can do. They would just keep it simple, just sort of the basics uh, for today. So visualizing these three lamas here. <clears throat> now we just, we can just feel that we're leading all sentient beings and all of our loved ones and everybody in taking refuge. So just once in English and then just from our heart here. So I had all sentient beings and to each human limb and both refuge to Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. And now generating refuge at our heart which is, as they always say, two uh, aspects to this mind, uh, two sides of a coin, fear and faith. So fa uh, fear of suffering, we don't want to suffer, any kind of suffering, old age, sickness and death and so forth. And faith or confidence is what's the medicine for suffering. Well, it's the three jewels, and in particular the Dharma jewel, and in particular out of the Dharma jewel, the teachings on happiness. So again, you don't want to get wet, you're running through the rain, and you realize, oh, in my purse, I've had an umbrella all along. I pulled this out, put it up, mm -hmm. and now I'm no longer getting wet. So you can just feel that all the Dharma teaching, especially emptiness, are, is the refuge we're taking from suffering, rain of suffering. Now, set your intention, Bodhicitta. Through the virtues we collect by giving other perfections, may we become a Buddha for the so again, everything we're doing at every moment is for the enlightenment, the realization of emptiness for all sentient beings that they don't suffer. The realization of uh, refuge, true refuge, realized, experienced, and sort of embodied, not just for ourselves, but for all sentient beings. And that by becoming enlightened, that's what we're going to do. We're going to help all sentient beings do this. So today, meditating and studying, that's our Okay, four measurables, may everyone be happy, may everyone be free from misery, may no one ever be separated from their happiness, may everyone have equanimity free from hatred and attachment. Okay, so inviting the merit field here. From the heart of the protector, the hundreds of deities of the joyful land, to the peak of a cloud, which is like a cluster of fresh white curd, all knowing Lo Sangra, the king of the Dharma, please come to this place together with your two chief disciples. So when we say this, just feel that the clouds bring in Jason Kappa and his two students come closer. Like I always say rolling on a yoga mat or something, big fluffy white clouds. Or just like a crane to see these cranes coming to go to cut the, fix the power lines or to cut the, cut the trees or something. It's coming down towards us. So when we actually look up us and all sentient beings, Jason Kappa and his students are just right here in front of us. And then kind of behind them, when you cock your head a little bit, oh, there's Tashita Pure Land. So they're coming right down in front of us to give us blessings and then just feel it's almost like a rope figuratively bringing us up there. So one 
Pova practice we can do when we die is really to follow the clouds back up into Maitreya's heart when we're dying. If we can do this visualization, feel that Jason Tap is kind of, as soon as they're coming to get us, like the crane's coming down and scooping us up and taking us back to, <clears throat> to Shita Pure Land. Baja Chala in, in um, famous <clears throat> Buddha, it's a Kriya the main sort of wrathful Kriya Tantra Buddha that you can do. In Japan, they call him Fudo Mio. And when I'm in um, Japan at the Narita Sun Temple, he's holding a sword like this. He's looking all fierce, and then he's holding a lasso or a hook. Um, you know, these have different functions to tie up negativities and so forth and to control mm -hmm. your mind. But uh, uh, after the fire pujas of the temple, we're allowed, us and all the sort of Japanese and civilians, like, <laughs> like the normal people like us, the monks allow us to walk in front of the shrine. And I, you know, it was kind of interesting. I didn't know what this was that a friend asked and told me. But everyone grabs a hold of this rope. There's this one rope. And then you walk holding it around this um, shrine. And I was told that that's Fudomio's rope that he's going to, yank you up to the pure land so it's, so it's like you're holding on you're creating the karma to hold on to the rope it's very sweet so the similar kind of thing here when we're really focusing on jason tap in front of us it's almost like bringing our mind our souls our spirits up to tashita pure land with the gaze here so he's right in front and we go in the space before me in a lion throne lotus and moon then we were a smile of delight supreme field of merit from my mind of faith Please remain for a hundred and to spread the teachings. Your minds of wisdom realizing the fullest and noble objects of knowledge. Your eloquent speech is the ear and honor of the fortunate. Your beautiful bodies are blazed with the glory of renown. I prostrate to you whom to see, to hear, and to remember so meaningful. Pleasing water offerings, various flowers, sweet smelling incense, light scented water, and so forth, a vast cloud of offerings will set out and imagine. Offer to you supreme field of merit. Whatever non virtues of body, speech, and mind have accumulated since time without beginning, Fleshy transgressions of my three levels of vows. With great remorse, I declare each one from the very depths of my heart. In this degenerate age, you strove for much learning and accomplishment. And then the eight worldly concerns, you made your leisure and endowment meaningful. A protector from the very depths of my heart, I rejoice in the great wave of your deeds. From the billowing clouds of wisdom and compassion, the space of your enlightened minds, venerable and holy gurus, please send down a rain of vast and profound dharma, appropriate disciple to this world. May your Vajra body, created from the purity of clear light, Free the rising and setting of secular resistance, but visible only the ordinary viewer, only in some um, subtle physical form, stay un unchanging without waning until samsara ends. Through the virtues uh, we have accumulated here, may the teachings and all living beings receive every benefit, especially may the essence of the teachings of Jesus and God shine forever. So, holding a purified universe, a mandala in our heart here, <clears throat> it's almost like you look down and you're holding like a big tray of food. You look down, it's like all the galaxies and universes are here, all beautiful, purified, made uh, amazing. And again, we can visualize, if you like, the sort of Vedic thing where it's Mount Meru and the four continents and everything, whatever is easier. And again, opening our hearts up to Jason Kappa and his two students. Really training your mind in generosity and giving. Because uh, once you're enlightened being, you are told what George Bataille, the French philosopher, would say, it's a solar economy, that you just give, 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 just like the sun. So we're kind of training for that here. If we just always visualize beautiful things as a mandala and offer them up to sentient beings and holy beings and really to everybody, because you're trained to be a Buddha that way. Ground sprinkled with perfume and spread with flowers. Great mountain, four lines, sun and moon, seen as a Buddha land and offer thus, all beings enjoy such pure happiness. I send forth this dear mandala to you, our precious teachers. Upon saying that, <clears throat> just feel that from Jay Sankapa's heart, the hearts of two his two students, Chapo Gasso and Kedrupche, beautiful golden light is going out. Just in all directions, just like a globe, or you can have it like a spotlight going out in the audience here, purifying all sentient beings, and just golden light. And then just like little pieces in.
um, was making a joke that the meditation was so powerful that the computer blew up there. <laughs> so anyway, uh, let me just do a few corrections here. Oh, the high captions are perfect. Okay, great. So um, we just started, uh, if this goes, I don't know how the recording is going to be, but uh, we just did the uh, meditation here and we're about to start the class. So keeping to our schedule here, just of what we're going through um, on the presentation of the Mind Only School. So again, um, I was just looking at my notes here, just what I've been uh, teaching over the last little bit. And again, I just want to try and make, uh, again, with Lama Ben's class and um, stuff online and everything else, I want to make sure that uh, what we're going through today is practical and helpful. And this in, is it a university class or some kind of philosophy class, or I don't want it to be overly difficult or intellectual. The most important thing is that this is basically therapeutic work that we're doing. This is for Dharma. This is um, for us to be able to understand um, emptiness uh, as best we can, that we be able to put it in our personal practice as a way of, again, solving our problems, in particular solving the big problem of samsara. So I just wanted to give like a little bit of a, a background. Um, like Jason Kappa wrote this book like uh, 600 years ago. It's kind of like, one, you know, what is, you could argue, it's kind of hard to say which, which one of his books is his best book, but um, this one's definitely, you know, up there is seen as sort of in a lot of ways one of his, or if not his masterwork. But it's kind of interesting because uh, I don't want to get too much into it, but when you had in, uh, just historically speaking, in the 19th century, you had a whole uh, cultural and philosophical and Buddhist renaissance in Eastern Tibet called the Rime tradition, which of course people might be familiar with. And the Rime tradition is where you had basically the three other non-Galupa schools, so you look at Nima, Kagyu, and Sakya schools, really great teachers from all three of those schools coming together and almost making an amalgamation of their different teachings and sort of showing that all three of these lineages sort of had more in common than they had separating them. And that, you know, this idea of like a, a, what Rime means is kind of like non-biased, non-sectarian view. So it's the idea of almost breaking down those uh, distinctions between lineages. So you had people like Jamin Kensei Wangpo, who's a famous um, Nyingma treasure uh, revealer, but he's from the Sakya tradition. You had one of the greatest Kagyu Lamas um, in history, Jamin Kontro I, who again had his own treasures and was able to codify a lot of the Nyingma tradition. Chucky Lingpa was a famous uh, Nyingma Teraton at that time teaching with them as well as Jumipam Rinpoche, which is con who is considered an emanation but of uh, wisdom. And is considered probably, besides Longchenpa, the great uh, Nyingma uh, philosopher or scholar of the Nyingma tradition. This is all in the 19th century. This is amazing. But as we've sort of looked at in other courses, how they're able to bring everything together is on their view of emptiness, the, the sort of more Shentong or emptiness of other views, sort of what we looked with Gorampa's view that they, anyway, I don't want to get into it because we're going sort of off topic a little bit, but basically <clears throat> if they sort of say that conventional reality or ultimate truth is separate than from, uh, I mean, I should say ultimate truth is separate from conventional realities, which on, on one level don't really exist in any substantial way, what that means for them is that all conventionalities, words, terms, concepts are all kind of fictitious. So you can see that what matters most is the ultimate truth of emptiness. And so that's why they were even able, Rime people were able to sort of say that lineages, techniques, paths in the big picture don't matter all that much. Because on a conventional level, they're just all names, concepts, forms, whatever. They're not really, they don't have any substance to them. They're like just, as Thomas Aquinas would say, just kind of like straw, piles of straw. Whereas in the Galupa tradition, what we're showing is that, uh, you know, the two truths, just like we looked at the class be the debate between Sankhapa Garampa, the two truths go together and you arrive at emptiness through conventional reality. Emptiness kind of guarantees conventional. So they're both are as important. They're like two sides of a coin. Uh, you can't separate them from another. Both guarantee the truth of one another. And so in that case, Things like lineages or paths or uh, concepts, words, terms really do have 
uh, in existence and really are important. So why is this important in terms of essence of true eloquence? Because um, what Jason Camp is showing you end up seeing is that he's criticizing the um, sort of trying to understand the sort of criticizing the, the down like the the problems of the mind only schools view of emptiness, but also showing what they get right. And why is this important is that you could argue that the mistakes the mind only school makes are mistakes that are later taken up in the Shentong view of emptiness are taken up in Garampa's view of emptiness and Dolpopa's view of emptiness that is just as popular today as it was hundreds of years ago. Like I say, when you go to most Tibetan uh, Buddhist schools, they sort of are, for the most part, Rime schools now. Um, their view of emptiness, emptiness of other, Garampa's view is very, very popular. So ironically, this book now is as relevant, in some ways almost more relevant today than it was when Jay Sankapa wrote it from a Galupa point of view because it's trying to show that this uh, uh, Jason Kappa's view is quite different than sort of the current running view that you get amongst uh, the other uh, different Buddhist schools. So let's go a little bit closer into this and see uh, what, uh, a little bit more in the mind only school. So again, uh, Jason Kappa says there's three metaphors for the, the three attributes. So the mind only school, we say there's sort of three things that exist. So at the end of Buddha's life, again, when he's turning the wheel of Dharma three times, so the first time he's turning in um, Sarnath, talking about the Four Noble Truths, the Arab Dharma teachings, basically things exist, they do exist, and the whole point is to see what does exist, to get clear on your, that your confusions, all your sort of wrong views don't exist. What does exist? Well, changing, dependent, originating things exist. Years later at Raj Griya, he goes, he starts teaching the uh, second turn of the wheel of Dharma. So the Mandyamika teachings. And at this point, which is interesting, you know, decades later or whatever, he's teaching this. And it's like he's going to teach that things don't exist. We think they exist, that things appear to be inherently existent, but really they're not. So he flips it the other way. Rather than saying what does exist, let's talk about what doesn't exist. So then you have his students, of course, at the end of his life, he, um, they say, okay, well, which one is it? Things don't exist or they do exist. Like we're all getting confused. So he does the third turn of Dharma, the turning a wheel of uh, fine distinctions. In other words, some things exist, some things don't exist. So what Jason Kappa wonders in this book, as you can see, is which one of these three turnings of the wheel of Dharma is the correct one? What do we take literally or what do we take figuratively? All Buddhist teachings are all kind of, seems to be full of contradictions and paradoxes and so forth. What's right? Like at the end of the day, what's the take home message as they would say? Which turning the view of Dharma is right? So most schools say that the final one is like if you're the Theravada tradition, let's say in Southeast Asia, only the first wheel is the correct one. But most Tibetan traditions really, when you look at especially the Mimit tradition, it's the third wheel because that's the one that Buddha ended his life with. So this is, as I'm leaving the last years of my life, this is the summation. This is what I'm trying to get at. Whereas in the Glupa tradition, Jason Kappa wants to show it's actually the second turning wheel of the Dharma that's correct. The Madhyamika teachings are the ones that, we, the, the, those are the ones we can hang on to as being the definitive one. So I always like to say what we end up saying is, uh, in terms of what do we, what's figurative and what's literal, what's, uh, you know, in Buddhist teachings. And I always like to say is that the only thing we can take literally in Buddhist teachings, the fact that everything's figurative or metaphorical. So we'll see why that that's the case, why that that's important. So um, the mind only school is sort of more the third turn in the wheel of Dharma. They say there's basically th three things we can talk about. There is mind, <clears throat> right, which does exist. This is sort of this uh, lay of a channel, storehouse consciousness or the eighth consciousness that truly exists. And within the expanse of this mind, you have subjects and objects, dependent arisings. These things exist as well. So the two things that exist, right, storehouse consciousness, and then within this mind, sort of this big theater of mind, you have individual experiential events, consciousness and objects that are dependent arising. They go together. You have a karmic seed, it produces an object and it produces a mind experiencing it. Now then what's the third thing Mind Only School talks about? Well, quote unquote, constructs, ideas, words, terms, metaphors, symbols, so forth. These things 
don't exist according to mind only. Okay, these are just a mediation between a subject and an object. There's things that we create, you know, their theories, concepts, this and that, trying to explain the world. But because they're representations and they're derivatives, they don't exist. So what um, Asanga and Vasubhava, these mind only people say, uh, coming from Buddhist teachings, that there's three metaphors. So num number one, emptiness is like empty space because the, it is the absence of something self-existing things. Two, constructs are like sky flowers, are made up by the mind. These can be names or terms. So whenever we say, so emptiness is like empty space, is an absence of something. This thing does exist. Constructs, the second attribute, when, when this is an old kind of like Asian thing where they say that there's magical flowers falling from the sky. Uh, that's kind of like an image used. And we use that image to say when something's fake, like it doesn't exist. It's like a hallucination, right? And then uh, the third thing is dependent uh, things are like illusions. They are coming from the same karmic seed. Uh, so subjects on. So dependent things are like illusion <clears throat> in the sense that it looks like it's there, but it's not. Right? It's illusory like a dream. So those are the three uh, in the mind only school. So taking back to the teachings here, the three sort of like uh, little metaphors we want to understand is emptiness is like sky like emptiness. Dependent originating things are like illusions. And again, constructs are ideas, our words, or our, our, our theories, or so forth, these kinds of things, because they're constructed, something we do, they don't relate to reality, they're fake. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, let's. Okay, you know what? I'll just go over these the last few terms and then I'll leave for, for some questions and answers because I want to go. Um, I'm going to look at, uh, yeah, a few things next week and say, I don't want to overload this particular, this is kind of a little bit of a review because um, I, I haven't taught for a few weeks. <clears throat> so let's just go and look a few more things in the third turning wheel of Dharma. Here, Buddha makes five distinctions about uh, what things exist by definition. So one, constructs which are imaginary things don't exist by definition. Number two, dependent things do exist uh, by definition from their own side, but they don't grow without their causes and conditions. Three, emptiness does exist by definition from its own side. Buddha said that, uh, that nothing is ultimate, meaning that things don't have a nature being self-existent. Most things uh, don't have a nature being what you see when you see emptiness directly. Okay, and... Um, Yeah, that was, uh, I might have said this again. And then everything, I think nature is, yeah, then there's five statements made by Buddha at the same, uh, the same time here in the sutra. Nothing has a nature of its own. One, nothing has a nature of growing or starting. Two, nothing has a nature of ending. Three, everything is peace or extinction from the beginning. Four, everything has gone beyond grief. And five, nothing has a nature of its own. So again, in these teachings of the sort of mind only school, the five things he's sort of showing, um, giving different sort of distinctions, again, drawing the distinction between dependent related things and emptiness. So um, just to conclude before questions and answers, I'll just say like the mind only school, if you look at the four major schools of emptiness in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, what's interesting is that uh, the first three ones like the Abhidharma schools, it was what's called the Vibhashka school, the Satrantic or logical schools, uh, the sort of uh, dialectical um, schools looking at perception, like the schools from Dignaga, the teaching of Dignaga and Dharmakirti, and the mind only school. What's interesting about them, what their focus is that it's kind of interesting. All of them are trying to get about what does exist, what truly exists. So if you look at the Abhidharma school, so in other words, how they're sort of understanding you getting enlightened is they're, they're saying you have to realize what really exists. You have to see what's true. So in other words, if you're sort of in a state of delusion or confusion or ignorance or so forth, the key is seeing the truth. It's like everything's dark, flip the light on, right? So what truly exists, if we're all in a realm of illusion or ignorance, what truly exists? Well, the Vimashka school is changing things. It's like everything's just all atoms or particles. That's what's truly exists. These things make forms and objects and so forth. 
that's what's true. So we have to sort of break everything down to their little parts, see that things don't truly like sort of exist inherently, but nevertheless, what does exist is that there's changing things. From the Sotrantica school, what's about truly exists again, changing things, and we have to see that our mind's concepts don't track them properly. So we have to see the distinction between our mind which is sort of making up stories about the world in the world, which is just a river of change. So this kind of uh, distinction or dualism between things is important for the school of emptiness because we're always thinking our ideas are true and unchanging and we're attached to them. And really the problem is, is that they can't adequately describe or represent reality. And so that's an important thing is it sort of allows us to try and get outside of our head and focus on the fact that things are always changing, that they're never what they seem to be. Now then the mind only school does it even better, which is basically they take the, the Satrantica school and they elaborate on it, it, things in more. And then again, mind only school is a little bit more new thing. What truly exists in the mind only school? Well, mind, mind exists and objects exist. But again, <clears throat> what's important is the mediation again between the mind and the objects. So objects and the mind are simultaneously coming from karma, so they're not separate. They all come together and yet our fabrications, ideas, and theories aren't true. So it's kind of interesting, the mind only school, because it's showing you what you're responsible for in terms of emptiness. Like my mind is true, everything is my mind. I'm responsible for everything. I'm actually responsible for all my ideas, my, the way I talk about, the way I think about things, but also at the same time, I have to see that those um, theories of things aren't really real. What's really real is, again, mind and changing things are real. They're out there. I have to focus on that and sort of take a step back from thinking that my interpretations of things are absolutely real all the time. It's kind of a very more subtle view of emptiness here. But what we're going to see when we look at the rest of the book here, Jason Kappa, is these three schools, again, uh, the Abhidharma school, the Satranta school, and the mind-only school, are all about fixating on what does exist. What is empty? So what's emptiness? What's ultimate truth? Well, for the low, two lower schools, is there's changing things. From mind-only school, what's really what truly exists well, in the end? The mind is what truly exists. That's what's important that sort of bare awareness itself in which all these things play into, that's what's most important. Now the middle way school or Madhyamika school says that these previous schools are wrong because they kind of have it ass backwards. Let's focus not on what truly exists, but the fact that nothing truly exists. This is kind of like the judo flip, is that how we're able to get to a more subtle understanding of emptiness, a subtle understanding of truth in Buddhism, isn't about positing something as being true, but seeing that the act of positing something as being true is the problem itself. Looking for the truth is the problem. Claiming things that are true or self-existent, trying to find what's truly true, that's the mistake in the first place, right? So that's, it's very, very subtle. It's really, I think, really, really powerful. So that's what we're going to kind of see in the rest of the book here is Jason Kappa and why that that's in the end, the second turning of the wheel of Dharma, the uh, sort of Madhyamika training is in the end a more subtle way of practicing Buddhism and seeing truth. And then we'll see why that's important. Why did he write this book in the first place, I would argue, is it's only on that basis that you can enter into Tantra. It's... That view of emptiness, the second turning wheel of Dharma that yokes together Sutra and Tantra, that shows that Tantra and Sutra are the same thing, right? That's the bridge. So we're always looking for what's the bridge between conventional reality and ultimate reality. This view is what yokes these two together. Whereas if you're in the mind-only school, they're always going to be separate. And you won't be able to do Tantra, which means you won't be able to get enlightened in one lifetime, which means you're going to have to meditate for three great aeons, which is a very long time. And chances are you're going to get very bored and discouraged. So that would be the take home is that it allows you to do Tantra. And yeah, you know, you can get enlightened in about seven lifetimes or maybe even in three years if you're really, really lucky. 
So there you go. Like just to end it on there is a little bit of a refresher. And again, I've got maybe when I look at my notes about three classes left for this course. Uh, and then we'll go, uh, do something different on the other side of this. But I actually really, really love this material. So this, I know it's like a lot of material. It's very, very intellectual. But does um, anyone have a little question or comment before we um, end for the, for the week? Hi, Matthew. Yeah, hi, Fred. Uh, something just occurred to me. I don't even know if it's got any relevance. But, you know, I'm thinking of all these schools. And to me, it, it does really seem an intellectual thing. And I'm thinking, do any of them harken back to, like, way back in history when, you know, there was almost, like, no language and people were still communicating in whatever ways they can? And I suspect it's on an intuitive kind of emotional level. Does that have any credibility with these schools or remember these schools like again it's it's in buddhist studies uh these kinds of schools seem so important um but they're very much the way that we're presenting them here is very much a product of a uh, tibetan culture right so these these positions it's not like the way they're presented in Tibetan Buddhism is if they're like political parties, like in, in Canada, we've got the, you know, the NDP and the Conservatives and the Liberals. And that, whereas when they sort of do uh, a lot of the historical analysis on this, they see that, let's say, in the great um, um, sort of Buddhist monastic institutions or universities in India, like Nalanda at the time, is these kinds of schools were positions held by people, but people would even hold multiple positions of these schools. They weren't set. So you can have in people teaching the same thing. They weren't so separate. They weren't kind of like um, in, in Tibetan, they're sort of seen as like big, big steps, but it was a lot more blurred together, to be honest, in India. And there's certain distinctions that are basically the creation of Tibetan scholars centuries later. And again, I'm not making fun, but if you're in Tibet, and you're isolated and it's snowing all year and you're a monk, a bunch of monks stuck in this university with nowhere to go and nothing to do. And all you do is read books. Then this stuff, you can see where this stuff comes from and starts to get really, really important and whatever. And then if those guys ended up in India, walk down, you know, it's nice and sunny. Everyone's running around doing all sorts of other things. They'd be like, dude, why are you getting so fixated on these silly little details, which in the big picture don't matter so much. Um, so yeah, different Buddhist traditions, like, you know, if you go to Zen, they'd be laughing you right out of the temple if you start running around talking like this stuff, right? This is sort of a bit of a unique presentation uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, particularly like, let's say the two schools of Magyamika, the Sotrantika and Prasangika, that's like a dis Tibetan distinction. Uh, Donald Lopez has shown that back in India, they didn't even make this distinction, for instance. So again, as always, um, pragmatically and therapeutically, how important is this stuff? Is it really important? Well, yes and no. You know, I, I sort of a little bit of ambivalent on this. Um, I think most people, uh, especially when you're practicing Tantra on a devotional point of view, you don't need to be very intellectual. But um, the intellectual stuff is important if you're an intellectual person, if you're going to have these kinds of doubts. So why they train the Glupa tradition, they get you to do all this intellectual stuff, is they say this allows you to have a correct view of emptiness in your mind so that when you're in retreat years later after you've left school, you don't start getting stupid doubts because you've done all the work, right? Not that I, like I, I wonder if you really would be in three-year retreat and like, is emptiness an affirming negative or not affirming negative? I don't know. But you know what it's like when you do retreat? you get all sorts of silly doubts and criticisms of yourself and confusions that start to come up as just a product of the purification process. And you might start having stuff where it's like, you know, I don't think uh, emptiness exists, or I think it's like this, or, or I think emptiness is God or whatever. And those are conceptual mistakes. And so it's the idea that if you study all this stuff, you're going to remove those kinds of problems later on when you're in retreat, kind of like in your Jungian process where you have all your demons attacking you, you start to having all these doubts and confusions and stuff. So I think on that level, it's important to study this stuff. But I don't think it's my own, even though I'm, you know, very educated man, this and that with masters in philosophy, but I, I don't think it's 
you, you lose the forest for the trees if you're just going to focus on the intellectual part of this and not meditate. I really, and again, I, I don't want to disrespect any but the scholars out there, but it's just like I say, it's like getting out of jail. The important things to get out of jail, not to, I, I use a little example from an old Sylvester Stallone movie. I saw my dad's about one called Lock Up or whatever. I mean, I mean you're getting laughed at why am I you mentioning this movie? But it's actually quite a profound part in it where he's wrongly sort of accused man, innocent man, put in jail for life. But he makes all these friends. And then there's one point where they're working at the gym and they have plans to do all sort of sports games in jail together. And they're planning it. And then he says, guys, my first priority is to escape not to spend the rest of my life in jail with you guys having fun <laughs> so from a buddhist point of view your first priority is seeing emptiness and getting out of samsara so all this intellectual stuff should only be about the jailbreak right like making the maps and getting the shovel and, and like the little pick to take through the wall mm -hmm. uh, the moment it starts to become, become something more than that as a distraction, then it's like a Mara because it's holding you back from getting enlightened, Sharon. So I think it's true. Like I think on an, if, if your practice or what your thing is more of an intuitive thing or whatever, getting emptiness, then that's great. If that's getting you along the path, I think that that's amazing. So is, is that okay? Does that kind of... Thank you. It's, yeah, it makes it okay. Good, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good. Okay, any, anything else before we wrap it up here? Or is, uh, is that good for now? So, okay, good. Well, we'll see, uh, hopefully, um, I, I have to go to work uh, at the end of this week here. So I'm gonna do a couple of recordings there. And uh, we will have, when I, I'll plan to be able to even finish the course over the next uh, couple of weeks when I'm in Hong Kong for work. Uh, when I get back to Nelson, I'll do a live class and we'll have a question and answer. And then I'd like to have uh, two live classes, which would be the live class of question and answer for all the course material, which is basically any question you have for, for the years of us uh, uh, studying together, we can have it. It's just kind of like a, a fun discussion and stuff like that before we go on. Uh, and let's say if we wanted to study uh, some of the theory behind Tantra, let's say, I think would be really, really nice. Okay, so let's take a moment to uh, dedicate uh, and uh, everything we have here, that by the blessings of all holy beings, the truth of karma, and the fiber appears for intention, you know, of our Dharma wishes be fulfilled. Okay, thank you. I'll stop here.